Hi everyone, uh, I'm here at Corey Halford Gallery uh, and I'm planning on doing a uh, walkthrough of my solo exhibition Into the Spirit Garden since it's not currently uh, open to the public. Uh, I'm here with my fellow quarantini, Lizzie. Say hi, Lizzie. Hi. Uh, and we're alone at the gallery, so we're not going to come into contact with anyone else. Uh, but I wanted to give everyone a chance to see some of the work I made, as well as uh, I wanted to just have a casual conversation about some of the themes that tie the work together and the narratives that I've explored uh, in this exhibition. Um, so I'll start out with some more general uh, thematic stuff about the, the work that I make, and then we'll move into individual works and uh, kind of move through the exhibition and, and see what comes up. So um, I guess just as a starting point, um, let's move over to, to this painting over here. Um, so uh, it, in, in kind of presenting what this work is and what my work has been, um, I'm going to kind of bounce around between works. Uh, so just starting off, I want to talk a little bit about the broader narrative that ties things together. Uh, my work uh, is woven together and tied together through this epic mythological narrative that I'm building. I have recurring characters throughout the work. I have uh, themes that tie together between exhibitions. Uh, some stories pick up where other exhibitions left off. Uh, it's, it's kind of sweeping in scope, but it's, it's a way that I'm uh, able to uh, process and filter some of the things that interest me and uh, reflect on them in my work. So uh, the protagonists of this story are the border creatures. Uh, and the border creatures are these uh, hybrid beings that you see in this work here. Um, they're, they're almost monstrous in nature. Uh, they're, they're, they have these physical deformities in which uh, you can see uh, the boundaries between them and the landscape starting to blur. So uh, the border creatures have lots of sort of floral anatomy. Uh, their human anatomy almost seems twisted and turned inside out. Uh, some of them have crystals forming on them, so they're, they're kind of referencing uh, more mineral deposits even. Uh, so they're, they're sharing this literal symbiotic relationship with the natural world where um, this world that I refer to as the borderlands uh, actually makes up their anatomy. And uh, in this mythology, uh, the border creatures were once upon a time humans, but they uh, sacrificed their lives as humans. They transformed themselves in order to uh, create this bond to the natural world. Uh, so the border creatures serve as the protagonists. So let's talk a little bit about the antagonists. So, Let's move over here. Um, the specters are the antagonists in my work. They're these glowing, ghostly beings that uh, inhabit the forest in, in these works. Uh, they're, they're kind of a, uh, an inverse image of what the border creatures are. So while the border creatures have this um, intense tie to the landscape that they live in, the specters exist almost parallel to it. So the way that they interact with the world uh, tends to be limited to uh, violent actions of uh, kind of asserting their dominance over the world. So there's a lot of lighting fires or carving messages into trees. Um, they, they essentially, um, within the narrative, and I'll, I'll get into this a little bit more specifically with uh, some of the um, uh, the, the works in this show, but uh, narratively, they're, they're kind of um, an idea made into a physical form, and they're, they're an echo of that humanity that the border creatures gave up. Um, so with that, uh, let's move to uh, the beings that, are, uh, that I refer to as the spectral witnesses. Uh, so you can see uh, in this painting here, these rainbow figures are spectral witnesses. Uh, within the, the mythology uh, that I've been building, uh, these are former specters who have taken a progression in their spiritual development, but are um, still being formed, still finding their path. Uh, 
So in the last exhibition that I had at Corey Halford Gallery back in 2018, uh, these beings were created when the border creatures managed to transform specters uh, and shake them out of their, their sort of static state. So they're a step forward, but they're still not finished uh, in terms of their spiritual progression. Um, so that's, that's kind of uh, some of the, the really uh, general narrative stuff. Uh, and I feel like at this point, um, I'll move away from just the, the exit sign here, just stand in front of something. Uh, so at this point, I, I feel like I should uh, address kind of how I think about um, the way people approach the narrative or how much they know of this lore. I always assume that people know absolutely nothing about my work and nothing about the narrative in my work. So for me, uh, the way that I present the work is not necessarily as illustrations to something that you have to have kind of read to understand or that you have to know all the ins and out of the narrative to, uh, to appreciate it so much as I have this very specific vision that I've built. And these are scraps of story that are scrambled and uh, hung on the wall in a way where a viewer becomes kind of this archaeologist of folklore, where I want people to have these pieces that they maybe aren't able to fit together in a totally coherent way without some work. So there's a good bit of sifting through these stories and, uh, and creating narratives of your own along with it. Uh, so, so as I talk about some of the, the specifics that I've built into this, I don't want it to feel like I've uh, closed off the ability to interpret the work in, in broader ways than what I'm speaking about. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, I, I think uh, because I'm building these paintings in such a, a, a narratively dense way, uh, providing so much visual information, uh, it, it's kind of inevitable that uh, there's enough in every single piece to tell an entire story, uh, to speak about a multitude of themes. Uh, and, and I think there's, there's a lot of space for viewers to do that without me having to, to talk at them about what the work is. Uh, but that being said, uh, I'll, I, I've had a lot of people express a lot of interest in the specific narrative of the show, so I'll just move through this in a somewhat chronological way uh, within the story. So. Let's hop back over to the prologue of the exhibition. So um, this painting is called The Origin of the Spectres, Part 1. Uh, this is set well before the rest of the, uh, the events of the exhibition. Um, this is kind of a, a backstory to how uh, the spectres got a foothold in the borderlands and entered. Uh, so here you see in the foreground uh, the character Painter uh, working on furiously on the, this kind of body of abstract work. Uh, and then in the background you see the other border creatures uh, having this celebratory communion. Uh, so I don't, I, I, in, the, in this, the, this two-part kind of pairing of paintings, I didn't spell out so explicitly what exactly um, created the specters or let them into the world. But what I did present was uh, an implication that something about uh, a shift in painter's worldview provided this foothold. And for me, that, that kind of is um, embodied in this separation uh, compositionally of this figure from everything else around them. Uh, you have this, this lush landscape, these, these figures that are embedded in the landscape uh, and, and then this figure in the foreground that's kind of isolated. So because the border creatures are communal, because they're symbiotic, uh, this, this move towards cutting oneself off from the world uh, is kind of a shift away from their, their natural state. Um, these notebooks are um, filled with writing. Some of it's just illegible scribbles, but I do have little scraps of... Um, uh, journaling that Painter has done in some of these. Um, so for that, I sourced uh, some texts by Piet Mondrian. I was thinking about uh, kind of the language of early modernism for presenting this this worldview, um, and uh, and kind of altering it to to fit the narrative in the show, but but hijacking and, and using some of that language uh, within the little scribbled texts. Um, you know, these are, these are the kind of details I bury in here that I don't even expect everyone to see, um, but it's, it's nice to have um, that level of minute attention so that there's a reward for really um, 
burying yourself in the work. Um, so with that, let's hop over to um, the finished version of this abstract painting in Origin of the Spectres Part 2. Uh, so this painting uh, is kind of the aftermath to the, the last painting I was um, talking about. Uh, here you see this was the painting that was on the easel. The easel's knocked over. The painting is now glowing, emitting light. Um, you know, I wanted it to feel like the act of, of creating this um, abstract representation of a, uh, a way of thinking, a way of seeing the world, uh, could have real-world effects. So, you know, it's, it's kind of the power of art to alter reality. And in this case, that's not always a good thing. So, uh, with, with Painter's obsession, um, you know, the, the obsession has, has opened this gateway and the specters have come flowing out. So here we see them, uh, the pink and blue specters lurking in uh, the background behind the trees. Uh, since this is set well before the rest of the exhibition, uh, you know, it, it bears mentioning that within the narrative and the chronology of the narrative, the pink specters are uh, extinct in present tense. Uh, they have all been transformed into spectral witnesses. So the only specters that remain in the borderlands are the blue specters, which were the male specters. Um, yeah, I think that's that's probably enough about these paintings. Um, so let's uh, let's hop over to, uh, I guess the, uh, the the arc of penitent spirit in that journey. Uh, so I think starting back over here with uh, these two little round ones. Um, so uh, actually, you know what? Let's. Let's go over to the far end of the gallery, if you will follow me, uh, and start even before then. Um, so, Penitent Spirit. Uh, Penitent Spirit was a specter, a blue specter, uh, and in my last exhibition at Corey Helford Gallery, uh, Terra Incognita, uh, as a specter, this character killed uh, a border creature called Bird Gardener. Uh, this composition is an exact mirror of um, the composition in uh, The Death of Bird Gardener. So this is Bird Gardener's aviary, and um, you can see uh, down here, this is uh, Bird Gardener's head that is uh, burning. Uh, it's, it's been a long time since the death of Bird Gardener, so I wanted it to feel kind of like a, a, a relic of a martyr. So it's, it's supernaturally preserved in this state of martyrdom where uh, it's, it's eternally burning. Uh, the cardinal at the bottom left is kind of this uh, little hopeful nod to uh, the persistence of life here, um, even with the death of Bird Gardener. Glow Gardener is the character that's playing the guitar, mourning the loss, playing this requiem. Uh, and then Penitent Spirit, now transformed, is coming to grips with, uh, with I guess, the guilt of what they've done. Um, so that brings us actually to um, these smaller paintings um, in which Penitent Spirit is uh, raising hands or lowering hands, and essentially that is um, uh, part of this ongoing journey where, where they're searching for redemption. So let's move over to uh, the end of this redemption arc with this painting here. So this is uh, Penitent Spirit's Search for a Space Between Heaven and Earth, Part 8, which is quite the mouthful for a title. Uh, but this is an ongoing series uh, that is, this is kind of the resolution to that series that I've been painting for a little while. Um, a lot of the, the previous works in the, the uh, Search for a Space series have been um, Penitent Spirit isolated in a landscape, uh, trying to find a connection uh, struggling to find a connection, and here at last we have uh, Glow Gardener and Penitent Spirit uh, paired together. Um, there's this moment of reconciliation where uh, there's a communal sharing of art through the form of the duet. Uh, so essentially what redeems Penitent Spirit from being a specter, from killing a border creature, is creating a tie to the community of the border creatures, is creating a way to uh, connect emotionally, connect physically, create empathy uh, that's, that's shared between these two, two beings. And that culminates climactically with the birth of a new border creature. Uh, 
So this painting is called The Birth of uh, Spirit Gardener. And um, here we see a penitent spirit uh, laying flat on this, this um, mound of flowers and uh, the spirit is transferring into this body that has been grown uh, that is the new being called Spirit Gardener. Um, I wanted this painting to have a kind of ritualistic feel so you can see uh, the fireworks that are getting launched by the water creatures in the boats here. Uh, they, they kind of mirror the, uh, the hues of the rainbow. So there's a movement from um, blue to violet to red to yellowish orange to green. So that kind of movement through the color spectrum is the ritualistic kind of mirroring of the body, an homage and a welcoming of this um, spirit into their new form. Um, and uh, I guess one of the, the things that I, I found interesting working through this narrative cycle is I wanted to present a story of spiritual progression in which, uh, I, I guess if you think about the, the ways that spiritual progression is usually depicted in, um, in literature and art, uh, there, there's a lot of times this emphasis on transcendence and transcending the physical. Uh, and in this case, that's, it's quite the opposite. So uh, the, the redemption arc, the spiritual progression of penitent spirit is uh, a story in which they are creating ties to the physical world, ties to nature, ties of community to other beings, um, and grounding themselves in the world. Uh, and that is their, their moment of redemption. And um, we will hop over to uh, a little portrait over here. Um, this is, uh, this is Stuart Gardner. Uh, this is the only, um, I, I think, like, what I would consider a strict portrait in the exhibition, um, but it shows Spirit Gardener. Uh, you can see that cardinal, again, that was in Requiem for Bird Gardener, perched on the thumb. Uh, that's kind of a way of visually connecting those two paintings, bringing it back together, this arc of uh, penitent spirit, being a specter, killing bird gardener, having this redemptive arc, and then the bird perching on them being this uh, revitalization of the spirit of bird gardener who is past. Um, also, uh, here you can see this this kind of... I, I, do, I do a few like narrative nods within landscapes sometimes, and in this one, uh, for that kind of hazy uh, violet red and orange sun, I was thinking about uh, the, the sort of color that a sun takes when it's, uh, it has smoke uh, in the horizon, so that's kind of a narrative nod to the, uh, the fires that the uh, specters are setting in the borderlands. Uh, so that kind of finishes uh, what I wanted to say about that arc, and um, that brings me to, I guess, the second um, uh, parallel part of the story that happens in this show. So as Penitent Spirit is journeying through the borderlands, trying to connect to the border creatures, trying to find this uh, sense of redemption, uh, the specters are up to no good, uh, essentially trying to create a new body of their own. So let's start over here with the Oath of the Spectral Brotherhood. <clears throat> So uh, this painting, uh, The Oath of the Spectral Brotherhood, is uh, a little bit of a, an art historical nod to uh, Jacques-Louis David's uh, Oath of the Herati, uh, this sort of hyper-masculine, patriotic, uh, stoic, uh, neoclassical painting. Uh, I, I kind of lifted a little bit of the, uh, the pose from the figures in that work. Uh, but instead of presenting it as this heroic thing, uh, here the Oath of the Spectres is, is kind of this terrifying moment uh, where they're essentially uh, vowing to claim the land for their own. Uh, it, it embodies this, this hubris, this uh, ego, this, uh, you know, this id uh, fighting to get out. Um, and as far as itty-bitty details go, uh, you can see carved into the torches here are the actual written words of their oath. Uh, so I believe uh, that is alone we are but torches, or we are but, uh, let's see, alone we are but torches as one we are a raging fire, burn your fields my brothers, so new light, we are the first and we will be the last, 
and no compromise, only light. So a lot of times in this exhibition I have carvings that, that the specters have used or their flag that they wave. Uh, I wanted these to feel like um, incantations or sigils, uh, almost like they're, they're casting magic through uh, creating a story. So uh, the words that they speak, the words that they carve into trees in the exhibition are their way of trying to reframe their own part of the narrative. Uh, so again, it's that classic idea that um, you know a villain doesn't know they're a villain. Um, they don't know that what they're doing is wrong. They don't have the, um, the perspective to understand what they're doing. And here in the corner, my little um, humorous uh, aside is the, uh, sp the border creatures hiding from the specters in uh, their spectral disguises, which are uh, essentially ghost costumes. So the conceit here is that when border creatures put on ghost costumes, the specters can't tell that they're not specters. Um, even though they're rainbow hued and just these uh, goofy ghost costumes, it's it's um, you know it's this thing about hiding in plain sight, um, and the the fact that the the specters have such a limited perspective that they can't even recognize what's right in front of them. Uh, but these these two border creatures are, are kind of hiding from them in the corner. Uh, so that brings me to again walk across the gallery to the far corner. <laughs> Um, so, the, uh, the second kind of arc of the story that involves the Spectres uh, is one in which they decide to build a champion, a hero that will help them defeat the border creatures and take over the borderlands. Uh, and they do this by kidnapping Painter here, who we've seen in some other works. Uh, they kidnap Painter and try to retroactively design a human body. Uh, but they are limited by their understanding of what humanity is, what being a body is. So um, what they end up producing instead <clears throat> is uh, closer to a skin suit than an actual uh, intelligent life form uh, with agency. Um, I'd say that this painting in particular carries a lot of what I was speaking about uh, in terms of their carvings. So. Uh, carved into the tree. I wanted uh, this, this jumble of text to be almost too overwhelming to read everything. Uh, so rather than feeling like ordered, structured poetry, I, I wanted it to kind of feel like a mix between mad rantings or um, you know, magical incantations. Uh, and essentially, if you do read scraps of this, a lot of it is uh, them reframing their part in the story in which they are heroes the border creatures are monsters and that they are trying to vanquish them. Uh, so it's, it's speaking, I guess, to uh, the double-edged blade of the power of myth, where uh, on one hand, it provides this structure with which you can understand your place in the world, understand and give structure to your, uh, your own story. Uh, but then on the other, it, it provides this powerful um, tool for manipulating reality, and that can be used uh, harmfully as well. Um, so here is a kind of a continuation. Uh, these diagrams uh, somewhat uh, follow their worldview. So uh, seeing the transformation of humans into border creatures as a fall from grace, and that uh, by becoming the spectral brotherhood, by taking over, uh, they can uh, purify the world. Uh, and, and their hero they're creating, their champion that they're creating is part of this. So they're kind of writing their own prophecy. The uh, champion, called the pneumatic vessel, uh, is modeled uh, largely on Hercules. Uh, part of the thought there is that the uh, specters, um, you know, they're, they're using human history to understand their own place because they're echoes of humanity in this sort of science fiction mythology. Um, they're using human history to understand that. So for them, uh, the model of Hercules is the model that they're using for their, uh, their hero. Uh, so that's why in the cloth that's down there at the bottom, it's a reproduction of uh, the apotheosis of Hercules or a detail of it uh, by Francois Lemoyne, which is a uh, fresco in the ceiling of one of the rooms in the Palace of Versailles. Uh, also, kind of buried in some of the text on these trees is, you know, there will be scraps of, um, of, of poetry that, that kind of mirror um, pieces from uh, Hesiod's uh, Shield of Heracles. 
Uh, you know, this isn't like a reference that I necessarily expected people to get, but I wanted, uh, it's more like I wanted to tap into that language of, um, you know, heroism, that language of um, dominant, like masculine kind of um, mythic energy, um, because that's essentially what they're, they're trying to create. So the exact um, kind of like next step narratively in this piece uh, takes us right over here. Uh, this is the awakening of the pneumatic champions. So this is the, uh, the figure that was shrouded and uh, on the table in the last painting. Uh, the skin suit is up and walking. And uh, like I said, it's a skin suit. So Spectre puts on the suit and they become the pneumatic champion. Uh, so this pose here, again, speaks to that sort of Hercules reference. That's um, uh, kind of a back view from the sculpture of the Farnese Hercules. Uh, and then the, the figures, the specters that are flanking on either side of the central figure are um, kind of a, a, a loose reference to uh, the choice of Hercules, which uh, I was looking at two different versions, one by Poussin and one by Anibale Karachi uh, for this, but uh, essentially kind of setting up this, this Herculean narrative over here. Uh, and then on the right side, you can see Painter, who was captured by the specters escaping with the assistance of uh, Snake Gardener, who was cutting the ropes uh, in the last painting. Um, so this is kind of where I, uh, I leave this part of the narrative. Uh, you know, I, I like to, to leave these open um, kind of narrative arcs for, you know, my next exhibitions to kind of continue things. So uh, the, this, this exhibition is more about um, spiritual progression, more about um, the way that we relate to community, relate to the world around us um, in both positive or negative ways, uh, but not about this sort of impending conflict, which I think will be probably uh, a show coming soon. Um, that's, uh, what, what, what time are we at? Just so I can get a, a sense of... About 30. About 30, okay. So I guess the uh, very, very last thing uh, I wanna talk about is um, jumping Back into um, the narrative arc of Penitent Spirit is the question of where did this body come from that became Spirit Gardener? Well, um, in the story, uh, the relic of Bird Gardener's head, uh, this eternally burning um, lump of border creature matter, uh, is carried by Painter, who's seen here uh, robed, uh, through um, forest infested with specters, uh, carried and planted uh, to, so in this, in this painting I'm referring to it as the seeds of the spirit garden. So uh, by planting this uh, relic, this head of bird gardener uh, in this specific location, uh, they're able to grow a new body that then will become a new border creature when it's uh, unified with pen and spirit. So uh, that will actually bring us over to the drawings, which um, are uh, the first drawings I've ever exhibited at Corey Helford Gallery. Um, and, uh, and I think they, they, they presented some, some really fun, engaging, formal um, aspects, but specifically within the narrative, because even as kind of being studies of form, these do fit into the narrative. Uh, so uh, these, these are the, uh, the blossoming of the spirit garden. Uh, the idea here was that I was drawing the, uh, the head of Bird Gardener after it was planted, then began to grow, began to uh, transform and expand and blossom into this new body. And uh, these are kind of the same form at different stages of development. So again, I've spoken a little bit about the symbiotic nature between the landscape and the border creatures. This is a study of that a little bit. You see plants literally growing on this new body. Um, spider web being woven here, um, the butterfly at the top, and then if we pop over to uh, this drawing over here, um, so this one is the same form, so this is the blossoming of the spirit garden uh, two, which um, again this is kind of a study of that same form at a different stage of its development. And eventually that grows into the, uh, the body of Spirit Gardener. Um, so I guess 
that is probably as much as I want to talk about the narrative in the show, but um, very briefly, I want to talk a little bit, and we can hop over to, um, uh, to the, the birth of Spirit Gardener, just to provide like a little capstone to those drawings. Um, so those forms that are kind of these abstract, um, mutated forms become this body eventually. Um, but anyways, um, kind of moving on from the narrative, very briefly, I want to talk about process, uh, and I think this painting in particular is a good one to talk about that for. Uh, I get a lot of questions about how I get my colors to be as luminous and in intense as they are. Um, I've posted some time-lapse videos that maybe give a sense of that, and I, I'm not shy about sharing some of my process just in captions on Instagram, but, uh, but it's a little hard to, to encompass everything. But just very briefly, um, to kind of describe what it is, Everything that's a painting in the show is an oil painting. Uh, and with that, I'm working with a lot of transparent colors uh, to glaze. Um, you know, a lot of artists glaze. I approach it in this very specific way. I've built a uh, practice around um, really uh, manipulating some, some color theory here. Uh, and, and I have my, my toolbox of colors that I use to do it. But uh, for this painting, I think I actually have a time-lapse posted elsewhere of this, maybe on my Instagram TV, but um, you can see uh, the, the sort of warm blue of these, these, uh, this sky here, and then that intense orange. Um, my, you know, my phone is probably butchering the color of this, but there's, there's really nothing that can be done for that. These are, are really visually intense in person. Uh, but these, uh, the orange here uh, is actually um, literally me taking a brush and scraping away paint uh, with a bristle, an old bristle brush to uh, reveal the bright orange transparent underpainting. Uh, so the, the clouds are actually created reductively by removing paint. And then the shadows are added on top of that. Uh, but even within that, um, you know, I, I use um, usually a, a mix of uh, direct painting techniques, which means just putting something down and it's totally opaque, and indirect, which is putting layers of transparent paint down. Uh, this painting in particular was a lot of transparent painting uh, to create this luminosity, to create this glow. Um, and uh, and I'll, have to, I'll have to do some more um, videos kind of revealing that process at some point, but, but I think that's probably um, about as much as needs to be said about it now. Um, yeah. So I think that about wraps it up, unless there's something you think I should talk about, Lizzie. I think you're good. Okay. Um, so anyways, uh, thanks for watching, and um, if you had a chance to come out to the exhibition while it was open, thank you so much for showing up. And if you didn't, I'm glad I had a chance to share it with you and walk you through everything. Uh, so stay home, stay safe, everyone, and uh, take care.